Lighthouse Scientific Education presents a lecture in the Molecules and Compounds series. The topic, Molecular Geometry. The lecture comes in two parts. The first part covers the most common of molecular shapes. All students are encouraged to watch this part. The second part covers the more advanced molecular shapes. Only students who are expected to have a more complete understanding of the standard molecular geometries should wade into this territory. Material in this lecture relies on understanding of the previous lectures. Valence electrons, octet rule and dot structure, covalent bonding, and Lewis dot structures, either the basic or advanced approach. Molecular geometry. The lecture begins with a description of molecular geometry and an overview of the most basic geometric shapes. It then moves into the model for determining such geometries. The theory most commonly used is called valence shell electron pair repulsion, or VSEPR. This model provides a basic understanding of the how and why atoms and molecule adopt the orientation that they do. The role of bonding and non-bonding electron pairs are visualized using an example molecule with four electron pairs, or domains, and then we're ready for the basic geometries. These are the ones that most students are expected to be familiar with at this level of chemistry. There are six shapes that fall under this criterion. Once the shapes have been introduced, the process of getting a molecular geometry from a molecular formula is discussed. An important feature of molecular geometry is polarity. While we have covered polarity from the perspective of a bond, in this lecture, polarity is discussed from the perspective of a molecule. The student's grasp of the material will be probed with a little quiz. And then it is on to the more advanced geometries. There are six shapes under the advanced geometry heading. After discussing these shapes, the lecture will end by connecting the advanced topic of hybridization to molecular geometry. Again, most students will not need to view this material. So, what is molecular geometry? That is a good first question. It is a three dimensional arrangement or orientation of atoms in a molecule. The term molecule implies covalent bonds. Here are some examples of common ways of displaying the three dimensional representations of molecules. It should be noted that textbooks, pictures, and computer screens are two dimensional. That third dimension, depth, is impossible to portray accurately in a two dimensional setting. There are a number of tricks that pretend to show the depth, but in the end, the viewer needs to bring a bit of imagination to the demonstration. For a truer understanding of three-dimensional structures, molecular model kits are unbeatable. This first structure is the water molecule. Compare this representation to H2O, the molecular formula of water. The molecular formula lacks information about orientation of the hydrogens about the central atom, oxygen. The dot structure of H2O provides more information about orientation. This is information about the arrangement of the hydrogens and the lone pair electrons around the oxygen. It is still a flat two-dimensional representation. It is, however, the starting spot for generating the molecular geometry of water. There are six basic shapes or geometries covered at this level of chemistry. Shape, orientation of atoms, and geometry will generally mean the same thing in this lecture. It is important to note that all the geometries refer to the arrangement of outer atoms around a central atom. For molecules with many atoms, the geometry of the molecule is really just the sum of geometries around each atom acting as a central atom. Before moving into geometries of large molecules, we need to understand the geometry around a single central atom. And that is what will be presented in this lecture. The simplest geometry is the linear or line geometry. Such geometries can have two or three atoms. Every two atom molecule will be linear. Two points make a line. Moving up in complexity, there is the bent or V-shaped geometries. The name is quite descriptive. There are two molecules representing the bent shape because there are two bent geometries. One V-shape is wider than the other. The next geometry is the trigonal planar geometry. Trigonal begins with the Greek prefix tri, meaning three. There are three atoms attached to a central atom. Planar indicates that all of the atoms 
are on the same two-dimensional plane. Contrast that with trigonal pyramidal. Some textbooks call this trigonal pyramid. Same thing. In this geometry, the central atom is not in the same plane as the three outer atoms. This is a true three-dimensional orientation. Another three-dimensional orientation is called tetrahedral. Tetra is the Greek prefix for four. There are four atoms attached to the central atom. This geometry is often the most difficult one for students to visualize. Not to worry though, we will cover each shape in some detail and try our best to give a sense of the three-dimensional orientation of the atoms. Before we discuss the characteristic of shape, we need to find a connection between the dot structure of the molecule and its three-dimensional representation. For that, there is the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, or VSEPR for short. This theory helps construct three-dimensional geometries from two-dimensional dot structures. It is based on the principle that electron pairs around an atom will repel or push away from each other. Pairs around an atom want to be as far apart from each other as possible. The geometries are an expression of this repulsion. There are a couple new terms that need to be discussed before putting pair repulsion into practice. The first is electron domains. A domain is the most probable position of a pair of electrons in space around an atom. Dot diagrams and molecular dot structures give some indication of these positions. There are two types of domains, and they were introduced in the dot structure lecture. The first domain type is the bonding pairs of electrons. Molecules have covalent bonds, which are shared pairs of electrons. These shared pairs are called bonding domains, or BD for short. Using the dot structure of water as an example, there are two bonding domains, one with each hydrogen. An additional point needs to be made here. Double and triple bonds, which involve multiple pairs of electrons, are still considered a single bonding domain. In the dot structure of molecular oxygen, the double bond is one bonding domain. The double bond is in one position around the atom in the dot structure. The other electron domain involves lone pair electrons. These are non-bonding domains, or NBDs for short. The oxygen in water has two non-bonding domains. In determining the molecular geometry of water, all four electron domains are taken into account. Electron domains are arranged such that they minimize repulsive forces. That is, they move as far apart from each other as possible, while still being in the atom's orbitals. Let's be clear on what repelling really is. As the name of the model suggests, electron pairs are repelling each other. Electrons are negatively charged. And each electron domain, whether bonding or non-bonding, repels all other electron domains in the atom. This is fundamental as to why atoms adopt the geometry around the central atom. A deeper look at how the electron domains give rise to the three-dimensional orientation is given using a four-domain molecule. The four in four domains comes from the number of orbitals that contain valence electrons. For molecules found at this level of chemistry, that includes a single s orbital and the three p orbitals, one plus three is four. Placing four electron domains around the central atom and moving them as far apart from each other as possible produces the tetrahedral arrangement. There is no top or bottom to this structure. All the outer atoms are the same distance from each other. As shown here, in this molecule, each of the four electron domains is a bonding domain. Methane, CH4, is an example of a molecule with four bonding domains. As mentioned earlier, it has a tetrahedral arrangement. Putting both pictures side by side provides some practice at recognizing three-dimensional structures from two-dimensional pictures. Both pictures are of the tetrahedral arrangement, but from different perspectives. A tally of the electron domains in methane show the molecule to have four bonding and zero non-bonding domains. Not all four electron domains have zero non-bonding domains. Drawn here is a molecule in which one of the bonding domains is a non-bonding domain. 
It is represented by two white dots residing in an atomic orbital roughly shaped like half of a dumbbell. From the perspective of the molecular geometry, non-bonding domains are not visible. They are not atoms. They are two tiny electrons. If one takes a tetrahedral arrangement and replaces an atom with a lone pair of electrons, such as found in ammonium, NH3, the central atom will still have four electron domains. But one domain will be a lone pair or non-bonding domain. This domain repels all other domains, be they bonding or non-bonding. In fact, the non-bonding domain actually repels stronger than the bonding pair electrons. Since each of the four electron domains in this molecule repel each other, the molecule will adopt a tetrahedral arrangement, but it will not show the non-bonding domain. The result is a molecular geometry trigonal pyramidal. Note that the non-bonding domain is not visible. It is still there. If non-bonding domains were visible, the geometry would be tetrahedral. This geometry has four electron domains, three being bonding domains and one a non-bonding domain. Taking away another bonding atom and replacing it with a second non-bonding domain, that is adding a second set of lone pair electrons, produces yet another molecular orientation, as found in water. The non-bonding domains repulse each other and the bonding domains. But since non-bonding domains are not visible, the molecular geometry is referred to as bent or V-shaped. The non-bonding domains are still there. They are just not displayed. Water still has four electron domains, but they are split between bonding and non-bonding domains to a piece. A third atom can be removed from our tetrahedral arrangement and replaced with a non-bonding domain. Such an arrangement is found with the polyatomic ion hydroxide. Two atoms can only form a linear arrangement, but the oxygen still has four electron domains. The chemistry of hydroxide is driven by those non-bonding domain electrons. A tally shows there to be one bonding domain and three non-bonding domains. What this exercise shows us is that four of the six geometries covered in this section can be gotten from a four domain central atom that arranges those domains in a tetrahedral pattern but does not display non-bonding domains. The other geometries have central atoms with only two or three electron domains. The six basic shapes covered in part one of this lecture are collected in this table of geometries. Columns in this table include total number of electron domains, that being two, three, or four. Electron domains in themselves are not enough to specifically describe the geometry. Each domain needs to be separated into the number of bonding and non-bonding domains. Starting with two electron domains, the separation will be limited to the geometry that has two bonding domains and zero non-bonding domains. There is a generic formula type that specifies the distribution of electron domains. Not all textbooks use it, but we will introduce it for those who will still need it. Here the formula is AX2E0. A is the stand-in for the symbol of the central atom. X is the stand-in for the outer atoms. There are two of them consistent with two bonding domains. E holds the place for the number of non-bonding domains. E0 says there are zero non-bonding domains. We will build on this generic formula as we build on the table. A three domain central atom can have two arrangements of electron domains. There is the three bonding domain and zero non-bonding domain, which is captured by the generic formula AX3 E0, three outer atoms X, and zero non-bonding domains E, or it can have two bonding domains and one non-bonding domain with the generic formula AX2 E1, two outer atoms X, and one non-bonding domain E. As for four electron domain central atoms, the options are four binding and zero non-binding with a generic formula AX4, E0, four outer atoms, X, and zero non-bonding domains, E, as well as three bonding and one non-bonding domain with the generic formula AX3, E1, three outer atoms, X, 
and one non-bonding domain, E, and two bonding and two non-bonding domains with the generic formula AX2E2. We could have also argued for one bonding and three non-bonding domains, but that would leave us with a two atom molecule and all two atom molecules are linear. It takes two points to make a line. This table has six unique combinations of bonding and non-bonding domains. We will flesh out each option beginning with shape. Molecules with a central atom with two bonding and zero non-bonding domains have a linear shape. The geometry has all three atoms in a line, the central atom and the two outer atoms. An example being carbon dioxide, CO2. A closer look at the dot structure of CO2 shows it to have two sets of double bonds. The double bond gets counted as one bonding domain because it occurs at one site in the dot structure. Another important feature of the geometry of a molecule is the angle between outer atoms. Angles are determined going from one outer atom to the central atom and then to another outer atom. The column heading includes the term idealized because there are additional factors for different molecules that affect the bond angles. The angles given here are based on perfect geometry and for the most part are fair values. For the linear shape, the angle is 180 degrees. 180 degrees is half a circle, going from one outer atom to the other outer atom. Moving to the next row, three electron domains, all of them bonding domains. The shape of these molecules is trigonal planar. The central atom and the three outer atoms are all on the same plane. Examples of trigonal planar is BF3. Boron is the most common atom in our study that adopts this geometry. The bond angles between the outer atoms are 120 degrees. That would be the degrees of a slice of pie if the pie was cut into three even pieces. On to three bonding domain geometries with two bonding domains and one non-bonding domain. Such molecules are said to have a bent geometry. These structures are somewhat similar to what we saw with water, but a closer look at the dot structure of the representative molecule, the polyatomic ion nitrite, NO2-1, shows the central atom nitrogen to have only one non-bonding domain instead of the two that are found on water. Additionally, nitrite has a double bond, which only counts as one bonding domain. As with other trigonal planar shaped molecules, the bond angle between any two of the three domains is 120 degrees. Well, not exactly. Remember that non-bonding domains, NBDs, actually repel bonding domains stronger than bonding domains repel each other. The effect of this is that the non-bonding domain will push the two bonding domains closer together. The result is that the bonding domains are closer than 120 degrees. How much depends on the makeup of the molecule, but we can add a less than sign in front of the 120 degrees to indicate the squeezing together of the outer atoms. Usually the answer to the question, what are the bond angles for a molecule like nitrite, will be just 120 degrees. That displays a sufficient understanding of how bond angles arise. Now to the four electron domain structures, which we've already reviewed. The first structure is the one where all four domains are bonding domains. That arrangement is tetrahedral. The four outer atoms are as far apart from each other as possible. Methane. CH4 is a good representative molecule. The idealized bond angles are all 109.5 degrees. And it doesn't matter from which atom to which atom is being measured. They are all the same distance apart. The next orientation is where one of the four electron domains is a non-bonding domain. Three bonding, one non-bonding. This orientation is referred to as trigonal pyramidal or just trigonal pyramid. Indeed, it does adopt a structure like a pyramid with three base points. Ammonia is a good representative molecule. The lone pair electrons in the nitrogen are not displayed in the structure, but they are there and affect the overall geometry. The bond angles between the hydrogens of ammonia are about 109.5 degrees, just like the tetrahedral arrangement. Actually, the bond angles are a bit smaller than that, 
since the non-bonding domain strongly repels the bonding domains associated with the hydrogens and effectively squeezes them together a little bit. A less than sign should be added to the front of the 109.5 degrees. The last orientation on our list is for two bonding domains and two non-bonding domains. That produces a bent or V-shaped structure, as we've seen with water, or H2O. The angles between the hydrogens will be that same 109.5 degrees. The same argument we made with the non-bonding domains on the nitrogen and ammonia can be made with the two non-bonding domains on the oxygen and water. That is, they effectively squeeze down the angle between the hydrogens. A less than sign can be added in front of the 109.5 degrees. This table holds a lot of information. A few important points can be summarized in the table as a whole. When looking at bond angles, there is a direct correlation between the idealized bond angles and the total number of electron domains. Two domain molecules have bond angles of approximately 180 degrees. Three domains have bond angles of approximately 120 degrees. And the four domain molecules have bond angles of approximately 109.5 degrees. When one or more electron domain is a non-bonding domain, the angles are a bit less and a less than sign is added. Initially, the newness and the sophistication of the topic of molecular geometry can seem a little overwhelming. It would be nice to have a process or set of steps that gets us to the correct geometry from the molecular formula. And that is what we have here. This set of rules is based on the dot structure of a molecule. The dot structures should either be constructed from the molecular formulas or be given as a starting spot. If there is resonance in the dot structure, Pick just one of the structures. Mostly it shouldn't matter which one. Using the dot structure and focusing on the central atom, count the number of places with a bond. Count the bonding domains. Remember that doubled and triple bonds count as a single bonding domain. Again, staying with the central atom, count the number of places with lone pair electrons. Count the number of non-bonding domains. Then, Take the number of bonding and non-bonding domains to a table of geometry. With just those two, we can find the shape of the molecule, the name of the shape, and parameters such as bond angles. All in all, it's not that complicated of a process. Still, a couple examples shouldn't hurt. The first example, PCl3, phosphorus trichloride. Step one, get the dot structure of the molecule. This is not the place to discuss the hows and whys of generating a dot structure. There are two other lectures in this series that specifically cover that material. We will just assume that the student can generate or be given the dot structure. For demonstration purposes, we can highlight the electron domains around the phosphorus by coloring the dots a different color. The valence electrons around the phosphorus are now colored blue or green. Using the dot structure of PCl3, we count the bonding domains on the central atom. One, two, three. Phosphorus makes one bond with each of the three chlorines. That piece of information should be written down. Next, we count the number of non-bonding domains. Phosphorus has one non-bonding domain. Write that down too. There's enough information to go to the table of geometries and find the correct geometry for PCL3. Take the number of bonding and non-bonding domains, three and one respectively, to the table of geometries and find the row with three bonding and one non-bonding domains. There it is. PCL3 has a trigonal pyramidal shape. The bond angles between the chlorines are 109.5. An inspection of the dot structure shows there to be one non-bonding domain that has the effect of reducing or making the bond angles a bit smaller. A three-dimensional representation of the shape shows the three chlorines to be in a different plane than the central atom. The similarity to the tetrahedral arrangement is evident. We need only imagine a fourth bond to be formed. PCL3. The second example is H2O. 
Finding its geometry begins with its dot structure. And then it's on the counting bonding domains. Oxygen binds two hydrogens. It has two bonding domains. We need to keep track of that value. As for non-bonding domains, the central atom oxygen has two. Write that value down. With these two values, two bonding and two non-bonding domains, that's a total of four electron domains, we're ready to go to the table containing molecular geometries. A four electron domain geometry that has two bonding and two non-bonding domains is the bent or V-shaped. As for the bond angle between the hydrogens, we see that this geometry shares the 109.5 degree bond angles with the other four electron domain geometries. Keeping in mind that there are two non-bonding domains in this structure that have stronger repulsion than the two bonding domains results in a decrease in the angle between the hydrogens. The bent shape of water is one of the easiest geometries to envision in three dimensions. All three of the atoms are on the same plane. H2O. Molecular geometries are not limited by the number of atoms in the molecule. The rules are the same for determining geometries of all atoms in the molecule. Case in point, ethylene, C2H4. Or more descriptive, H2C, CH2. The four hydrogens are split between the two carbons. But which of the two carbons is the central atom? The answer is both of them. They both have a geometry that is determined by the number and type of electron domains around them. Here we will only look at the geometry of one of the carbons. Carbon colored blue, which is attached to the other carbon, colored black, and two hydrogens. As with all geometries, this one begins with the dot structure. There's a double bond between the carbons, and a single bond between the carbons and each of the two hydrogens. This is a more complex dot structure but it does serve to show us the role of the double bond and that geometries are not limited to a single central atom. Again, the focus of this demonstration will be in the electron domains on one of the carbons. Begin by counting the number of bonding domains. There's a double bond, which we know only counts as a single bonding domain, and there are one, two additional bonding domains for a total of three bonding domains. Are there any non-bonding domains? No, there are no lone pair electrons on the carbon. Therefore, the total number of electron domains is 3 plus 0, or 3. We have the two values we need to go to the table of geometries. Where is the row that has three electron domains, of which all three are bonding domains? It's found right here. The shape is trigonal planar. The bond angles between the outer atoms and the blue carbon is 120 degrees. Since there are no non-bonding domains to squeeze the bonding domains closer together, it will stay at 120 degrees. The three-dimensional representation of ethylene shows it to be a molecule with all the atoms in the same plane. The 120 degree bond angles for the atoms around the carbon color blue is readily apparent. Think of cutting a paw into three pieces. We should also note that that other carbon, the one color black, has the same trigonal planar geometry as the blue colored carbon. If we had chosen to follow that carbon, it too would have had three bonding and zero non-bonding domains. C2H4. Our next topic is molecular polarity, and it builds on an earlier topic from the covalent bonding lecture. That lecture described the polarity of a bond as a function of electronegativity. Specifically, a bond is polar if the difference in electronegativity values of the two atoms is greater than or equal to 0.5, but less than or equal to 1.9. There's some minor variation in these limits. Some textbooks have the upper limit at 2.0. Now, a basic understanding of bond polarity and the dipole is required to proceed on this topic. That is the student's responsibility. A brief refresher on bond polarity will be given before the lecture takes on the topic of polarity from the level of the bond to the level of the molecule. As a heads up, it's not as simple as saying 
a molecule is polar if it has polar bonds. For the polar bond, the oxygen-hydrogen bond serves as an excellent example. Calling up a periodic table containing electronegativity values, we see that the hydrogen has a value of 2.1 and the oxygen a value of 3.5. The difference in electronegativity is found by subtracting the larger value from the smaller value, yielding a value of 1.6 which indeed falls between 0.5 and 1.9. The oxygen-hydrogen bond is polar. There is a dipole between the oxygen and the hydrogen. One side is more negative at the expense of the other. Another important consideration in molecular polarity is geometry. On the bent geometry of water, H2O, a dipole arrow can be drawn starting at the hydrogen, low electronegativity, and pointing to the oxygen, large electronegativity. Since there are two oxygen-hydrogen bonds, a second arrow can also be inserted. The orientation of the second arrow also follows from low to high electronegativity. There are two polar bonds on this molecule. Does having polar bonds make the entire molecule polar? It depends. Whole molecules are polar if one, they have polar bonds. This one has two dipoles. And two, the trickier one, the dipole sum to a net dipole. This requirement will need further explanation. We will start by redrawing the two dipoles of water. They are given the same length and the same orientation as the ones on the molecule drawn here. The two dipoles are in the same dimensional plane, just like the points of a compass. The compass is a good companion here because its dimensions are already marked out. It has an east-west dimension, left and right, and a north-south dimension, up and down. Each of water's dipoles can be broken down into components that align along these two dimensions. Adding dipole components that are in the same one dimension is much easier than adding the dipoles while they are in two dimensions. Starting with the east-west dimension, the dipole on the left has an east-pointing component. The dipole on the right, a west-pointing component. Both are colored blue here. In the north-south dimension, up and down, both of water's dipoles have north-pointing components. Both of these are colored green. The original dipoles have been broken into components that represent the dipoles. The east and west components, the blue arrows, can be added directly together since they are in the same one dimension. And since they are in opposite directions, when added, they cancel out. It's like adding a plus 5 to a negative 5 and coming up with zero. That just leaves the green vertical arrows, the north pointing components of the dipole. They too can be added directly together since they are in the same one dimension, north and south. The two arrows have the same length and they go in the same direction. Adding them together would be like adding a plus five to a plus five and getting 10. The result is a dipole that is twice as long as either of the green arrows. It is the sum of adding the original dipoles together and not the easiest concept to grasp on a first pass. This is a net dipole and is added to the molecule. The polarity of the molecule is not along the bonds. It starts between the hydrogen and heads into the oxygen. It is the sum of the bond polarities. This leads to our first declaration on polarity and geometry. If a bent shaped molecule has any polar bonds, it is a polar molecule. There is really no way to orient the dipoles on a bent-shaped molecule such that they completely cancel out. One last point. Often, molecular polarity is shown with what is called an electron density map. Basically, that involves coloring the more electronegative region of the molecule red and the lower electronegative region blue. There is some blending of blue into red moving along the net dipole to the arrowhead. The map provides a visual representation of polarity at a glance. Geometry, as we've seen, plays an important role in whether a molecule with polar bonds is itself polar. This is especially true with the shape trigonal pyramidal, such as found in a molecule of ammonia. As a heads up, for this shape, if there are any dipoles, they will always be a net dipole. The nitrogen-hydrogen bond is polar because the difference in electronegativity is 0.9. All three dipoles are oriented toward the nitrogen. 
the three hydrogens are spread out evenly on the same two-dimensional plane. As we did with water, we can treat that plane as if it had the points of a compass. As a thought experiment, meaning that we're going to do it in our head, we can break each of the three dipoles into components oriented along three dimensions. Two of the dimensions are the ones we saw in the water polarity example. East-West is a dimension. North-South is a dimension. The third dimension is coming straight out of and going straight down from the plane of the compass. If we combine all east-west dipole components, we would find that the east component cancels out with the west component. If we combined all north-south dipole components, we would find that the north components cancel out with the south components. There would be no net dipole in the plane of the atoms. However, each dipole has a third component that points up out of the plane. Adding those components together produces a net dipole that starts between the three hydrogens and points towards the nitrogen. Again, these three-dimensional considerations are not always easy to visualize. A molecular model kit is the best way to visualize the logic used in determining net dipoles. The electron density map shows the area around the nitrogen to be more electron rich, red, and the area around the hydrogens to be more electron poor, blue. It was stated earlier that the trigonal pyramid shape is polar if it has any polar bonds. What would happen if one of the hydrogens was changed into another atom? We will color it blue. And this blue atom nitrogen bond did not have a dipole. We would remove that. Would that remove the net dipole from this molecule? No, it doesn't. It simply changes the direction of the net dipole. Without that third component, the remaining two dipoles that are along the north-south and east-west dimensions do not completely cancel out. The sum of those two remaining dipoles is therefore a net dipole that still points at the nitrogen, but begins at a place between the two remaining hydrogens. The electron density shifts accordingly. Trigonal pyramidal is a shape where no combination of dipoles will completely cancel out. If there's a bond dipole, there is a molecule dipole. Let's take a run through our list of geometries as a function of the number of electron domains and see how bond polarity plays out on the molecular stage, starting with a geometry that only has one dimension, the two electron domain linear orientation and a molecule like carbon dioxide. The carbon oxygen bond in this molecule is polar because the difference in electronegativity 3.5 minus 2.5 is 1, which is between 0.5 and 1.9. Adding the bond polarity shows us that the dipoles of the two carbon oxygen bonds are the same size but pointing in opposite directions. As such, when combined, the two dipoles will cancel out and there'll be no resultant net dipole. Another one of those adding a plus 5 to a minus 5 and getting 0. Carbon dioxide is not a polar molecule. Yes, it has polar bonds, but they do not result in a net dipole. But what if, staying with the linear molecule, a different atom was attached to the carbon, we'll color it blue, that did not yield a dipole for that bond? The lone remaining dipole would have nothing to add to and therefore be considered the molecular dipole. In that circumstance, the linear molecule would be a polar molecule with the polarity pointing at the remaining oxygen. Bottom line, it is the combination of polar bonds that determine molecular polarity. The next geometry to be explored for polarity is the trigonal planar. Three electron domains, all of them bonding domains. The polyatomic ion carbonate has just such a geometry. There is a double bond, and that brings its own set of considerations, which we will put off for the time being. Let's consider carbonate as consisting of three carbon-oxygen bonds having a bond angle of 120 degrees. The carbon-oxygen bond is polar, with the dipoles pointing out towards the more electronegative atom, oxygen. Carbonate has three dipoles, but is it a polar molecule? Is there a net dipole? The adding of the bond dipoles, which is how the net dipole is made, is harder to visualize with this arrangement. One trick or thought experiment that can help with thinking in three dimensions 
is to consider each bond as a string attached to the central atom. Each string is pulled in the direction of its dipole. If pulling all three strings with the same strength, same length dipole, causes the carbon atom to move, then there is a net dipole. If, on the other hand, the pull of the three strings cancels out with each other, the carbon atom will not move and there will not be a net dipole. Does the carbon atom move in this thought experiment? Do the three dipoles sum to a net dipole? No, they do not. The pull of the three strings cancels out. There is the same amount of pulling to the east as to the west. Cancels out. There is the same amount of pulling north to the south. Cancels out. There is no net pull. There is no net dipole. But what if one of the oxygens is replaced by another atom, colored blue, that does not form a dipole? Back to the thought experiment. But now there are only two strings. And pulling on those strings will cause the carbon atom to move in this direction. The net motion is the net dipole. The net dipole is pointed between the two oxygens. The electron density map shows there to be more negative charge in the region of the oxygens and less around the carbon and the atom represented by the blue sphere. The last geometry in our investigation of polarity is the tetrahedral arrangement. Carbon tetrachloride will stand in as an example of the arrangement. A check of the electronegativities has carbon at 2.5 and chlorine at 3.0, giving the carbon-chlorine bond a slight polarity with a difference in electronegativity of 0.5. The dipoles are oriented along the bonds pointing towards the chlorines. If visualizing the addition of three dipoles was difficult, the addition of a fourth dipole may seem unmanageable. The tetrahedral arrangement is not an easy three-dimensional arrangement to think in. It takes some practice. Still, we should try the same type of thought experiment and replace each dipole with the string connected to the central atom. If each string was simultaneously pulled with the same strength away from the carbon, would the carbon move? Does combining the four dipoles together yield a net dipole? No, it doesn't. When combined, the four dipoles cancel each other out. This just might be a point that the student takes on faith. But what if one of the chlorines is replaced by an atom, colored blue, that does not form a dipole? Without that dipole, there is no pull in the direction that comes out of the screen to counter the pull that goes into the screen. In and out of the screen is the third dimension. The combination of the remaining dipoles will therefore result in a net dipole pointing back into the screen and the molecule will be polar. The electron density map has the red electron rich region around the chlorines which are going into the screen and the blue electron poor region around the carbon which is coming out towards the viewer. Polarity with the tetrahedral arrangement is dependent on the summation of the dipoles in the molecule. It's time to put what we've learned to the test. In this quiz, pause the lecture after each question and solve the question on a piece of paper. Not to worry, a full explanation will follow each question. Question 1. What is the geometry of sulfur dioxide? Okay, since the dot structure has been provided, we can move into the next step, which is counting bonding domains. There are one, two bonding domains around the sulfur. Double and triple bonds count as one bonding domain. Keep track of that number. Then it's on to counting non-bonding domains. Sulfur has one non-bonding domain. Keep track of that number. 2 plus 1 is 3. Sulfur has 3 electron domains. Take the number of bonding and non-bonding domains to the table of geometries and find the shape for sulfur dioxide to be bent. The bond angles between the oxygens is about 120 degrees. Will that one non-bonding domain affect the bond angle? 
Yes, it will squeeze the oxygens together a bit. The next question asks, what is the geometry for a generic molecule that has the formula HRH, where R is a standard for any atom that adopts this structure? Put an oxygen in for R if you want. Well, having been provided with a dot structure, we can head right into counting bonding domains. There are one, two bonding domains around the central atom, R. Write that down. And what about the non-bonding domains? There are one, two of those. Write that number down. Two plus two is four. There are four electron domains in this molecule. Take these values to the table of geometries, where we find two bonding domains and two non-bonding domains to belong to the bent or V-shaped orientation. Note, however, the bond angles for this bent shape is 109.5 degrees. This highlights an important area of confusion. The term bent is used twice in the table of geometries. But there is a difference between the bonding angles of the outer atoms. What distinguishes the difference is the number of electron domains, and specifically the number of non-bonding domains. Non-bonding domains are not visualized in the molecule, but they do affect the final geometry, because it is the total number of electron domains that gives the orientation of the atoms. The next question in our quiz asks, what is the name of this geometry? It also wants to know what and where are the electron domains. Since the shape has already been provided, we might as well go to the table of geometries and find out what it's called. This shape is called trigonal pyramidal or trigonal pyramid. The table also provides us with information on the number of bonding and non-bonding domains. It gives three bonding domains and one non-bonding domain. That is the what are part of the question. How about the where are part? Starting with the three bonding domains, there are one, two, three. Those are actually quite easy to find. It is the non-binding domain that takes a bit of thinking. We know that the trigonal pyramidal shape is a four electron domain shape. Early in the lecture, we saw that the four domain shape is essentially a tetrahedral. Bonding domains being shown, non-binding domains not being shown. To get a tetrahedral, out of this molecule, where would that fourth domain be? Right, here. A fourth domain is a non-bonding domain. It is a lone pair of electrons on the central atom. The last question asks if this molecule, BF3, is polar. There are two components to determining molecular polarity. The first is the presence of polar bonds, dipoles, and the second is that the addition of the dipoles produces a net dipole. As for polarity, fluorine has a much higher electronegativity than boron, resulting in the difference in electronegativity of 2.0. This bond is so polar that it can even be considered ionic. In this problem, we will treat it as being very polar. Dipoles are added along the bonds with the polarity pointing towards the fluorines. This molecule does have dipoles, but do the dipoles combine to form a net dipole? Since this is a planar two-dimensional molecule, we can treat the two dimensions like they are the east-west dimension and the north-south dimension of a compass. A thought experiment has us breaking each of the three dipoles into component dipoles that align with the compass dimensions. In combining dipoles along a dimension we would see that the east dipoles cancel out with the west dipoles, as does the north dipoles with the south dipoles. There is no net dipole, and this is not a polar molecule. We can ask an additional question regarding the shape and polar bonds. What if one of the fluorines was replaced with a chlorine? A blue sphere represents the new chlorine atom. Is the boron chlorine bond a polar bond. That would involve the recalculation of the difference in electronegativity. 
Boron still has a value of 2, but the value of 3.0 is added for chlorine. The difference in electronegativity is 1. It still is considered polar. Remember, the difference in electronegativity for boron fluorine was 2.0. This value for boron chlorine is distinctly smaller. The smaller difference gets boron chlorine a smaller dipole. Length of dipole is proportional to the strength of the dipole. Is this molecule polar? We could return to the compass-based thought experiment, or we could reason that a smaller dipole will not cancel to the same degree as a bigger one did. The components of the boron-chlorine dipole do not fully cancel out with the two boron-fluorine dipoles, resulting in a net dipole. Yes, this is a polar molecule, and it is quite electron-rich in the area of the fluorines and to a lesser degree, electron-rich in the area of the chlorine. That concludes the first part of this lecture, which explored the basic shapes that most, if not all, students will be exposed to. Some students, however, will be asked to have a knowledge of additional molecular shapes. Specifically, these shapes will have five or six electron domains. If the student falls into that category, then they should continue on to the second part of the lecture. If not, they can skip to the recap at the end of the lecture. Part 2. Advanced Shapes in Molecular Geometry The first part of this lecture looked at shapes based on 2, 3, and 4 electron domains. But there are also molecules with central atoms that have 5 and 6 electron domains. As we saw in our investigation of the tetrahedral arrangement, Additional shapes are found by replacing bonding domains with non-bonding domains. Being lone pair electrons, the non-bonding domains are not displayed, and this results in new geometries that have a pattern based on the structure found with all bonding domains. Structures for atoms that have five electron domains will be based on the trigonal bipyramid shape, that is a shape when all five electron domains are bonding domains. Structures for atoms that have six electron domains will be based on the octahedral shape. Octahedral is a shape where all six domains are bonding domains. Both of these shapes have two orientations of electron domains, and they follow a very familiar pattern to the globe of the Earth. On the globe, there is an axis running through the north and south pole. The north and south poles are axial positions. On both of these advanced molecular shapes, there is an axis running through the central atom in two electron domains. Domains placed in these positions are referred to as axial positions. What about the other electron domain positions? They're related to another feature of the globe. It is the equator. Electron domain positions related to an orientation similar to the equator are called equatorial. The trigonal bipyramid shape has three electron domains that are in equatorial positions. The octahedral shape has four electron domains that are in the equatorial position. Another feature we can gather from this globe is the angle between the poles and the equator. It is 90 degrees from the North Pole to the equator. On our advanced molecular shapes, it is 90 degrees from an axial position to an equatorial position in both geometries. The angle between the equatorial positions requires a bit more thinking. We know that to go all the way around the equator, which is a circle, is to go 360 degrees. To find the angle between the equatorial positions requires us to count the number of equatorial positions and use that value to divide the 360 degrees. Think of it as cutting up a pie. For the trigonal bipyramid shape, the count of equatorial positions is 3. The angle between them is therefore 360 degrees divided by 3. That gives an angle of 120 degrees. It is 120 degrees between an equatorial position and a neighboring equatorial position. For the octahedral shape, there are 4 equatorial positions. 360 degrees divided by 4. That gives an angle of 90 degrees. It is 90 degrees between an equatorial position and a neighboring equatorial position. Both axial and equatorial angles in the octahedral arrangement are 90 degrees. And that brings up an interesting question. 
for the octahedral arrangement, is there really a difference in axial and equatorial positions? The answer is no. Octahedral is a very symmetrical shape. No matter how the molecule is rotated, there will be two bonding domains that can be considered as being in an axial position. Nevertheless, we will stay with noting the axial positions because it makes generating the other two six domain shapes easier to follow. And we'll get to that shortly. All right, let's sum up what we found so far. Beginning with the trigonal bipyramid shape, its generic formula is AX5, A standing in for the central atom and X standing in for the outer atoms, of which there are five. It is a five electron domain shape. The axial equatorial angle is 90 degrees. The equatorial equatorial angle is 120 degrees. For the octahedral shape, its generic formula is AX6. It is a six electron domain shape with an axial equatorial angle of 90 degrees and an equatorial equatorial angle of 90 degrees. Each of the shapes gives rise to two additional shapes consistent with a bonding domain being replaced with a non-bonding domain. The shapes will be introduced here before covering them individually in more detail. Based on the trigonal bipyramid shape, there are the sawhorse or seesaw shape and the T-shape. Based on the octahedral shape, there are the square pyramidal and the square planar shapes. These shapes can be summarized in a table of advanced geometries. First, to the two fully bonded shapes, and then to the shapes that have replaced some of their bonding domains with non-bonding domains, beginning with five electron domain shape in which all five domains are bonding domains, AX5, E0, where E stands in for the number of non-bonding domains. This, of course, is the trigonal bipyramid shape. PCL5 is a representative molecule, and the idealized bond angles are 90 and 120 degrees, as recently shown. There are two other five domain shapes, one that has four bonding domains and one non-bonding domain, AX4, E1, and the other that has three bonding domains and two non-bonding domains, AX3, E2. For the six electron domain shapes, there is the fully bonded shape, AX6, E0, zero non-bonding domains. It is the octahedral shape. A representative molecule is SF6, and all of its bond angles are 90 degrees. There are two other six domain shapes, one that has five bonding and one non-bonding domains, AX5, E1, and another that has four bonding and two non-bonding, AX4, E2. A major question that arises from this table is that in moving from the fully bonded shape to those with non-bonding domains, which of the bonding domains is replaced with non-bonding domains? Are the domains in the axial position? Or are the domains in the equatorial position? The answer depends on whether we're talking about the five electron domain shape or the six electron domain shape. Five electron domains are going to replace equatorial positions. And the six electron domain shape will be replacing axial positions. We will look at both types of replacements. Beginning with the five electron domain shapes and its representative molecule PCL5. Earlier in the lecture, a three-dimensional representation of the tetrahedral arrangement was used to demonstrate how four electron domain structures, whether those domains are bonding or non-bonding, follow the overall tetrahedral orientation. Here we're going to do the same thing with the five and six electron domains. In the five domain arrangement, two of the three equatorial bonding domains will be replaced with non-bonding domains to generate the other two structures. Remember, non-bonding domains are lone pair electrons and are not displayed on the structure. We will start with all five domains as bonding domains. As PCL5 spins around, the axial positions are clearly seen as being in line with the central atom. The equatorial positions are like three pieces of a pie. Replacing one equatorial bonding domain gives a sawhorse or the seesaw shape. 
Both the axial positions are still visible and act like seats in the seesaw. Replacing a second equatorial bonding domain produces the T-shape. Again, the axial position bonding domains remain as as a single equatorial position. With only one equatorial bond, the molecule is, as the name implies, T-shaped. Five domain structures. Returning to the table, the sawhorse or seesaw shape has a single equatorial non-bonding domain. SF4 is an example of such an orientation. And like other five electron domain structures, has bonding angles of 90 and 120 degrees. The T-shape orientation looks like a T. It has two equatorial non-bonding domains. ClF3 has a T-shaped orientation. Since there are no other bonds in the equatorial position, the only angle of interest is the axial equatorial angle, and that is still 90 degrees. Well, to be completely accurate with bond angles, we have to remember that non-bonding domains repel stronger than bonding domains. These angles can be reduced somewhat due to the presence of non-bonding domains. Now to the six domain structures. SF6 is a representative molecule when all six domains are bonding domains. In generating the two additional five domain structures, the equatorial bonding domains were replaced with non-bonding domains. For the two additional six domain structures, the axial positions will be replaced with non-bonding domains. Yes, we earlier stated that in the octahedral arrangement, any two domains on opposite sides of the central atom can be considered axial. That still holds. Why we say that the axial positions are the ones replaced with non-bonding domains is that the second replaced bonding domain is in an axial position with the first. They are across the central atom from each other. Watch. All bond angles in the structure are 90 degrees. No matter how it's spun, it looks the same. If one of those bonds is replaced with a non-bonding domain, the structure is called square pyramid. It has a base of four bonds and it goes to a point. A pyramid with a point in an axial position to the non-bonding domain. Replace that point with a second non-bonding domain and the molecule is square planar. The four bonds make a square since the two bonding domains in the axial position are not displayed. Six domain molecular shapes. Returning to and finishing up the table of geometries, a six domain shape where one of the domains is a non-bonding domain is called square pyramid. BrF5 is a representative molecule. The bond angles are all 90 degrees, as would be expected for a six electron domain shape. Unless, of course, one of the domains is a non-bonding domain, which repels other electron domains more strongly than bonding domains do. A reduction in the 90 degree axial equatorial bonding angle should be expected. The last shape on the table has six electron domains in which two are non-bonding domains. It is square planar. The non-bonding domains are in the axial positions from each other. The polyatomic ion ICl4- adopts such a geometry. The bonding angles of a square are 90 degrees. And since the non-bonding domains are symmetrically placed above and below the square plane, there's no change in that 90 degrees. That completes this section of the lecture on advanced shapes. A last advanced topic remains, and it too is one that most students will not need to spend much time with. It is the role of orbital hybridization in molecular geometry. The material on this topic is compiled in a table of geometries, in which the last column is the hybridization for the geometry of the row. This material requires a basic understanding of hybridization as is covered in the Advanced Covalent Bonding Lecture. Only geometries in which all electron domains are bonding domains will be covered here. Including non-bonding domains is a bit trickier and a subject matter for a more advanced chemistry course. Starting with the two electron domain shape, linear. Two bonding domains means two hybridized orbitals, 1s and 1p. S-p hybridization 
It's that straightforward. On to the three electron domain shape, trigonal planar. It has three bonding domains and will need three hybridized orbitals, 1s and 2p's, sp2. And then there is the four electron domain shape, tetrahedral. It has four bonding domains and will need four hybridized orbitals, 1s and 3p's, sp3 hybridization. That's all the s and p orbitals. For the five electron domain shape, hybridization will need five hybridized orbitals for the five bonding domains. That will require 1s and 3p's and an additional d orbital, sp3 d hybridization. And finally, the six electron domain shape octahedral. It has six bonding domains and will need six hybridized orbitals. Like the five domain shape, it will use 1s and 3p's and then move on to the d orbitals. It will need two of those, sp3 d2 hybridization. The relationship is clear with shapes that have all bonding domains. One hybridized orbital for each bond, and that completes the hybridization section. Now for a recap. Molecular geometry is a three-dimensional arrangement of atoms in a molecule. Valence shell electron pair repulsion theory is based on the principle that electron pairs around an atom repel each other. Electron pairs are in electron domains. These are mathematically the most probable position of pairs of electrons in space around an atom. The electron pairs can be bonding pairs, bonding domains, BD, or lone pair electrons, non-bonding domains, NBD. Importantly, electron domains are arranged such that they minimize repulsive forces. They are, after all, negatively charged electrons. The geometry of a molecule can be determined from its Lewis dot structure. Using the dot structure, count the number of bonding and non-bonding domains. Take those values to a table of geometries. Locate where the values of the BD and the NBD count are on the table. Most students will be asked to have an understanding of basic geometric shapes. Those are geometries that have two to four electron domains. Some students will be asked to have a familiarity with advanced structures. Those are geometries that have five and six electron domains. Polarity is an important consideration with molecular geometry. Molecules are polar if they have one or more polar bonds. These bonds are dipoles. Another consideration is whether the dipoles sum to a net dipole. This involves some thinking in three dimensions and is really helped along with a molecular model kit. For those who need to understand geometry and hybridization, the hybridization will be a combination of S, P, and D orbitals that match the count of bonding domains. And that concludes a very busy lecture. Geometry is a topic that needs to be touched. Know what is expected of you and practice.